Hello and welcome to the Global Dialogue. I'm Shireen Bhan. It is my absolute pleasure to welcome on the program Jenny Johnson, the Global CEO of Franklin Templeton. Jenny, what an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us here on the program. It's great to have you in India. Well, thank you for uh, having me on the program. It's a fantastic program. So I'm uh, excited to be here. Uh, you know, Jenny, uh, you've been a long-term observer of India. In fact, you spent about six months living here in India. So before I talk to you about what's happening in the world, let's talk about what's happening in India. Uh, what's the sense that you get? What's the feel that you get about the strength of the story? What it means in terms of fund flows potentially from here on? You know, I think India is the, the great possibility that just hadn't quite happened. And you feel like right now it's all coming together and happening. You know, it, it, the demographics are phenomenal. You know, 56% of the population is under the age of 25. You have you know, some of the best schools in the world. So at the top tier level, phenomenal education. I think India graduates six times the number of engineers than the U.S. does. Uh, and, you know, the, the saying was always, um, you know, India grows at night while the government sleeps. And you've, it feels like we've gone from this kind of unorganized economic policies to a really organized economic policies to, to generate growth. And you're seeing that in the story. So, of course, in being in the asset management mutual fund business, yeah. right? The wealthier people get, the more they're able to save. And so we look at this growing middle class as just a massive expansion of the opportunity. You know, you talked about mutual funds uh, and banks are facing a challenge saying, look, uh, we're losing out on deposits because everyone's decided to go the mutual fund way. Uh, how are you reading what we've seen happen as far as that part of the story is concerned? I mean, I think that's always been the case, right? Where people, when they first start saving, they put their money in a bank account. But ultimately, to achieve the true retirement goals that most people have, you actually have to get equity returns or even higher fixed income returns. So, you know, the bank account's a great uh, solution for a portion of your wealth. But to really accumulate and save, you have to be able to step into, you know, things like the equity so markets. So given, given the confidence in the India story, given the confidence in reforms that we are seeing at this point in time, you know, what do you see in terms of fund flows? We've, of course, also got additional factors like the inclusion into the global bond index, which will potentially uh, bring a lot more of foreign portfolio money into the country. How are you seeing foreign fund flows into India over the next uh, few months? I mean, the interesting thing is um, FDI into India has not been particularly high uh, for a variety of reasons. Yeah. And I think that there, again, this is where organized economic policies matter. You know, Gift City is going to be an important uh, solution to that. And I think it's designed specifically to bring flows in. So we, of course, as a global manager, are excited about uh, participating in that and think it's a great way for our overseas investors to invest money into India. Uh, you know, you talked about overseas investors looking at India potentially at this point in time. What's looking exciting from a sectoral perspective? Uh, you know, private equity has been has been having a great run in India over the last few years as well. Uh, where do you actually see the money coming in at this point in time? Are there any sectors where you believe that we could see disproportionate amounts of money coming in versus others? You know, I think that, first of all, private equity has had a great run globally. Mm. Um, and I think part of that is because interest rates were so low globally. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see whether it has as strong of a run uh, kind of in the next decade. Although, uh, certainly what we're seeing in the U.S. is companies are waiting a lot longer to go public. So yeah. you're, you're not seeing it, The wait public. time is now, what, 14 years? Yeah, versus 14 or 15 three years. Three to four or yes. 10 years ago? Exactly. And so... Uh, and I think there's a lot of reasons why that is, but um, you, you, it's also, if your private equity was all about borrowing cheap and being able to invest in a company and trying to grow the company, that model's gotten a lot more difficult when, when money's more expensive. So I think that that could be a little bit more challenging, but I think, you but know... that's I, a challenge for you as well, right? As an <laughs> asset manager with less and less companies going public. Oh, it's definitely a challenge. I mean, that's actually why we've done acquisitions in the private space, because we see secular trends both in the equity side where they're waiting longer to go public. So we want to participate in there. As a matter of fact, we got into the venture business mm. uh, in our growth equity team who started to do late stage venture because the old IPO deals that would give you kickers in performance were now happening in the, in the private markets. And so we started, we were able in the U.S. to, to uh, allocate up to 15% of a fund in, in illiquid assets. And so we, we started to do late stage, late stage venture there. 
Also, because banks have had capital requirements that have changed, mm. you don't see banks lending in the same way, and that's created this massive private credit market. So I think those things are very real, and we look at it and say our job is to create a broad spectrum of capabilities for our clients uh, along the, ri the, the risk spectrum and uh, be able to provide whatever solutions our clients are looking for. So private markets is an important a part of that. And then I would just back to your original question about kind of where to invest. You know, I think it's, it's always better, I would say, to swim with the current. So you look at the big, broad opportunities. Energy transition yeah. is going to be an opportunity. I think everybody's really committed to that. Infrastructure, obviously the infrastructure that is being put in place by the support of the government is going to be important. Uh, any kind of dom domestic consumption. You know, mm. the great opportunity in India is as you create wealth, people are going to be able to spend more in the domestic economy, and that's going to create opportunities. So again, kind of, you know, think about what the broad trends are and then invest along with those. Well, yeah, those are some of the trends that I think people are looking at and focused on at this point in time. But, you know, Jenny, I want to talk about what you're seeing happen as far as valuations are concerned, especially in the private markets and whether you have a view on what's happening in India, because we do have a fairly robust startup ecosystem, which is deep and broad today. Uh, but there has been this dissonance between public market and private market valuations. We've seen a recalibration and a reset, especially over the last two years. Years. Uh, how are you reading that story? You know, it's interesting. Um, I think we have a particularly good vantage point to look at that because we own um, uh, an asset manager called Lexington Partners mm. that does secondary private equity. And so they buy from uh, limited partners of private equity holdings. They'll buy pieces of their uh, pools of their, their investments because maybe they have liquidity needs or They've got a commitment to um, investing in another round of the private equity firm, so they want to reduce the amount of exposure they have on their, uh, uh, in their portfolio. And what we're seeing is uh, primary private equity uh, is, is selling for about a 18 to 20% discount mm -hmm. from where it's priced. Um, but, and then, and then real estate's kind of in the mid to high 70s. Late stage venture is probably at 50% discounts, wow. and early stage ventures are essentially not being able to be acquired. Um, so again, this is, this is somewhat in the mature markets around, um, you see that phenomenon. And then you have to break it down. You know, real estate office, people often don't even want to buy office. I mean, they, that, that's been, I, I don't know that we've seen the floor on office, mm. but things like residential are still holding up pretty well logistics, data centers, those types of things are holding up pretty well. So, you know, there's variations within. Now, that doesn't mean that the valuations are wrong. Mm. Part of that problem is that there's been six trillion deployed yes. in private equity. Yes. There's only about 150 billion in secondary PE. And as you see less distributions and less realizations of those private equities, the, the limited partners who own that fund aren't getting the kind of cash flows that they yeah. have historically gotten. And so they're sitting there with an over allocation to private equity. So they need to sell it to a secondary manager. So that's been a real uh, advantage. So it's as much a supply and demand as a valuation issue. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Jenny, let's talk a little bit about uh, the India business and, and uh, what you intend to do now uh, in India. You ran into a, a fair amount of rough weather in 2021, yes, we to, to yeah. sort of put it mildly. Uh, but what kind of course correction have we seen you do post that to deal with uh, the regulatory action that was taken and, uh, you know, what the road ahead looks like now in terms of the cleanup? Yeah. No, we were, um, you know, the first foreign manager to set up in India in 1995. And a, and a lot of folks followed us in and, and exited the markets. And we've been you know, committed to the market for the 27 years and continue to be very committed to the market. And unfortunately, we did run in with COVID. We ran into real serious liquidity issues uh, in our uh, fixed income portfolios and had to make an incredibly difficult decision of closing down those funds to preserve value for clients. And, and you know, the problem is you have responsibility to both uh, manage your clients' assets and, and give them good returns. And the good news is, since then, we have paid back uh, almost 110% on average across the portfolios. Um, and uh, But we didn't meet the liquidity needs that people had at those times. And that's a real shortfalling. Um, 
but in order, again, to give kind of the fairness across all the investors, we made that tough decision, even though it, it you know, has been painful from a reputational standpoint. And a lot of people thought we'd exit India mm. at that point. But again, you know, looking at it, India from the long-term perspective, we think this is, this is India's decade. I mean, if you think about it, it was last decade, it was China's decade. This is India's decade. Uh, and if it keep, can keep doing what it's doing, it's going to be a phenomenal place for us to be as, uh, as an asset manager. We've always loved India, but I think we're kind of at that hockey stick point of the, the growth where you know, you've been growing the business here, but as that middle class takes off, I think that's what we're going to see in the next decade here. Uh, you know, you said that uh, the, the speculation was that you would exit India. You haven't. You're here and you're saying you're here to stay. Uh, what have been the, the lessons and the course correction post what happened in 2021? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think that the, the key is, is always communicating. As I said earlier, you, our job is to provide a series of products across the entire risk spectrum. So from you know, very conservative fixed in, income to, you know, ultimately equities, aggressive equities, or even private markets in some cases. Uh, but the key is, is to communicate exactly what that looks like. Uh, and, you know, I always say to people, what we learned, because if you think about what's happened over the last couple of years, you had COVID, which basically froze up the fixed income markets globally. As a matter of fact, there was over 60 billion globally that were in funds that people had to close down because of the, the, the freezing of those markets. You've had two wars. You have the tension between the U.S. and China. And it reminds you back to saying, you know what, those lessons of diversified portfolio, make sure you have a diversified portfolio because you never know yeah. when that next crazy thing that's going to happen. Um, you know, we, 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 Franklin introduced SIPs into India. Yeah. That consistent investment. We call it dollar cost averaging. When the market's high, you're buying less shares. When it's low, you're, you're, you're buying more shares. Over time, you will average above. Um, and, and that kind of discipline of staying in the market and keeping that discipline around investments, I think, is really important. And I just look at it and say the last couple of years, it's a reminder that those fundamental you know, tenets of investing still matter. You highlighted some of the pain points that we are continuing to face in the world today. So what's the global outlook? Uh, uh, interest rates, uh, it looks like the Fed is pushing out uh, the cut. Uh, at least it was anticipated perhaps March, but it looks now closer to June. Uh, we don't know if it, it will yeah. finally play out that way or not. But uh, what are you reading in terms of uh, global macros? So first of all, we have um, we have five different fixed income teams with five different CIOs, and they all have do they have do, do they have a different take on when the cuts takes. coming? <laughs> so I'm going to give you my take. Um, look, I. I think, and I've been saying for a while, that if we're going to get a hike, it'll be in the second half. When we get a hike, it'll be in the second half of, you mean of a cut. this year. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, a cut, cut. <laughs> no. uh, That's I, like cute. Gonna cut, yeah, it's going to be in the second half of the year. You know, the consumer is still really strong in the U.S. The Fed came out, or the Atlanta Fed came out with wages saying they're over 5.3%. That's pretty inflationary, nowhere near your... 2% target. There's 1.4 jobs still available for every one person looking for a job. Uh, Michigan sentiment survey came, in, came out saying, you know, people feel incredibly that the, the, the sentiment is, is much more positive. Um, so the consumer, and you see the consumer spending. And as a matter of fact, uh, our Dr. Sonal Desai, who's the CIO of our uh, Franklin Fixed Income team, just came out with her on my mind talking about productivity. Yeah. We're seeing productivity gains now starting to take off. And so you know, that's all signs of a very robust economy. So I think it's going to be harder for the Fed um, to reach its 2% number. And I think it may be pushed out for those cuts uh, to the second half of the year. I think the market's still a little bit optimistic to think that they're even coming. I mean, we'll see. I think they are being data driven. But June may be too optimistic. Mm. You know, uh, we're now sort of in this high interest rate era, uh, and it looks like it is going to be higher for longer. Uh, what are the implications, not just for large corporations, which at this point in time don't really have a debt problem? The sovereigns have a debt problem. Yeah. Companies don't necessarily have a, uh, a large debt problem at this point in time. But what do you see as the implications for growth, for profitability in this high interest rate era? 
So I first have to say that you're a lot younger than me <laughs> because the reality is these rates are more like normal rates if you look in history, right? So it's uh, real rates are probably a little high, but you know it's not. Yeah, it's not totally out of uh, out of the historical norms. It's just the last probably 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, I think the the good news is most companies knew that this was uh, that, that that this the rate hikes were coming. Uh, and so they actually positioned themselves very well with longer term debt at, at low. And so if you actually look at it, most companies in the S&P 500 right now, between what they're earning on cash, which is much higher, and what they're paying on their debt lower, is that the cash flow, they're actually cash flow positive. positive. Now, the question is, what happens when it all gets has to get reset? And that's going to see you're going to start to see a challenge. Um, but there aren't a lot of companies in the next two years that have to reprice their debt. And so I think we're probably fine for a while. And you hope that growth in an economy continues to grow their business out of worrying about when they have to reset and borrow again. Mm. You know, speaking about the reset, and you talked about productivity gains, and I think, uh, you know, through the, the start of 2024 and through the end of 2023, the focus has been on AI. It's almost as if it's this sort of magical silver bullet that's going to solve all of our problems. But I know you ran tech. Uh, yeah. uh, so, so what's the take on AI and what it could mean for organizations like yours in the near term. So the interesting thing I say, you know, AI, why are we suddenly all talking about AI? Because ChatGPT came out just like the internet browser and suddenly we all had AI at our fingertips and we started to understand what it could do and the possibilities. I mean, but the reality is machine learning and other has forms been of around. It's been around. Yeah. People have been using it, particularly anybody who was doing kind of quant portfolio management or any kind of overlay. Um, but I think what's exciting is generative AI that basically is the chat GPT version, uh, which is more language oriented, you know, for somebody like Franklin Templeton, we're, we're, we're active managers. It's about our managers being able to consume more information mm -hmm. in a way where they're not trying to chase down each little individual report and, you know, it can come together uh, and just make efficiencies around time. Uh, the ability for salespeople to really gather more information to understand a client when they're going to go into the client and have a much more effective meeting. Like those are the immediate things that I think we're going to see. Um, you know, there's things where people are applying AI to, to earnings calls to mm -hmm. say what words were being used and these predict this and that. I think we're going to see all those things. But what happens anytime new technology gets in the hands where it starts to get go broad, yeah. the first things that, that happens is people just make whatever they do today more efficient. Hmm. And we're in that stage with AI, which is we're just creating efficiencies. We rolled out uh, a chat bot on our internal help desk for you know the, the, the technology, desktop technology, and it's answering 60% and, and clearing 60% of the queries. Wow, that's great. That's a cost savings and an efficiency. Um, it takes time for the real innovation, I think, to ultimately happen at AI. And we are very much in the early stages of it. Yeah, I would imagine so. But, uh, you know, Jenny, uh, what are the key risks that you're going to be watching out for from here on? Of course, what happens as far as interest rates, et cetera, are concerned, I, I guess to some extent is already uh, factored in. But outside of, outside of the geopolitical risks, what are the other key risks that you're watching out yeah. for? Well, I think the geopolitical risks are big. I mean, you know, you, you uh, an expansion of the war in the Middle East could have impact. Um, U.S.-China, you know, we, we, uh, we own a joint venture in China and we're working on trying to, you know, buy it out and, uh, you, you always worry about whatever policies can end up, you know, throwing you and from the course that you're on. Um, I think cyber security is always every CEO has got to have cybersecurity in their top three uh, as far as risks that they worry about. Um, but honestly, I'm incredibly optimistic because in the end, we're active managers. We make active risk decisions, investment decisions, and that's still necessary. And now we can deliver it. We can leverage tools like AI to be able to be better in our decision making, and we can customize solutions for our clients that are that aren't just a, a mutual fund, but something that you know is a mutual fund that is directly on a glide path to a client's specific need with for retirement or whatever their goals are. And I think that the tech tools that are coming out are really interesting to be able to deliver much more customized solutions. You said that you're optimistic, but is the mood more risk on or risk off at this point in time? You know, I think everybody's waiting for, first of all, everybody was waiting for, oh my goodness, it's gonna be a hard landing or a soft landing. I think most people feel like 
uh, we are at a soft landing. Um, look at U.S. debt is a concern. I do worry about the amount of U.S. debt. Like I, I, I think the, it's not a risk to the dollar being the reserve currency, but um, it starts to crowd out other investments. Mm -hmm. And it also, uh, you know, U.S. the debt went from I think it was in 2007. It was yeah. nine trillion to now it's 33 trillion, and we're probably adding two trillion a year. Yeah. You have to have buyers of that debt. And uh, you, you know, at some point, you have to attract enough demand to that debt, and that could mean that interest rates end up staying higher. Um, so I think things like that are, are concern. Um, but you know, again, you've got a particularly in Asia where you have a growing population. I mean, India, as I mentioned, the population that's a great tailwind for any economy, um, and those are all new customers for us. And the pie gets bigger and. That just helps us. Uh, you know, you've, you've, of course, been on m and drive. Uh, inorganic growth has been yeah. driving growth for you at Franklin Templeton. Is that going to continue to be something that you focus on and drive harder? Well, we'll always, uh, we'll always look at it. But our, it falls very clearly into three categories. It's either we're filling out product gaps. And a big product gap was, um, was the uh, private markets. And so we feel today we're $260 billion in private market assets. We're a top 10 alternatives okay. manager. So. Mm -hmm. We feel really good about where we are with that. The second area were, are tools that help us build deeper relationships mm -hmm. with our partners. And so, you know, if you're a financial advisor, it's no longer that the client's satisfied with just getting investment advice. They really want full financial planning. They may want education of their heirs. They may want you to educate them on, you know, financial literacy. And so, like, we have the Franklin Templeton Academy. Uh, so we've invested in tools that help to to help our partner financial advisors build deeper relationships with their clients. And then the final category is, you know, we have shareholders in 160 mm. countries. Uh, people tend to invest 80% in their local market before they go outside. And so we've always been a buyer of local asset management. As a matter of fact, we set up organically in 1995, but we acquired a company, Pioneer, uh, a few years later. Uh, in India, and so getting that kind of capability, and we've sort of done that throughout the world. And so, are you op are you open to M and A here? So <laughs> it's funny, my my head of the country just asked me that question. <laughs> um, what did you have we're, to we're, say? We're <laughs> always we are always looking, but we're actually really happy with the the investment folks that we have. So uh, you know, we're we're, uh, we're 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 probably going to stay focused on what we can do and. If there's any M&A, it would probably be more on distribution and those kind of fintech tools or, or things that help us build broader and deeper relationships with distributors. So let me end then by asking you, Jenny, the outlook for the markets and more importantly, the outlook in 2024 as far as the alternative market is concerned. Um, I think the, the, uh, well, the outlook on the markets, I, you know, I, I look at the U.S. and one of the things that concerns me in the market is that you have this huge concept concentration of Magnificent Seven. Yes. Um, top 10 stocks in the U.S. market uh, account for about 30% of the market cap of the S&P 500. At the peak of the dot-com, the top 10 was about 26%. So we're more concentrated. Now, there's other ways you can slice that data that you'd say, well, it's maybe not quite as bad as then. But, I mean, that is a real concern. And um, I think there's some really great companies there. I I'm tending to prefer going a little bit more conservative, making sure that you've got companies with good cash flow. I love getting paid a dividend. Um, but, you know, where's the growth been last year? 71% of the S&P 500 return came from seven stocks. So, you know, they, they clearly um, have, have done well and they're great companies. But that kind of concentration makes me a little bit nervous. Um, but I still think, as I mentioned earlier, that the consumer is pretty strong. Uh, and... Um, with that, you'll have the market stay pretty strong. So I think the markets will probably be okay. Even people worry about, is India overvalued? Again, you just continue this growth story and you're not overvalued if that's the case. Yeah, and, and the markets have been have been moving higher and higher yeah. every time somebody talks about the fact that valuations are far ahead. And you asked about the alternatives. Look, at I still think those secular trends in the alternative markets makes the demand in both private equity, private credit uh, still very real. Um, but I think that it is not going to be as easy a story as it's been over the last decade, just because interest rates are higher. 
Well, Jenny, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us here Thank on you. CBC TV 18 on the Global Dialogue. We wish you the very best of luck uh, with your trip here in India and look forward to seeing you back here again. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's really been fun. Well, with that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of the Global Dialogue. From all of us here on the program, many thanks for watching. A quick break. There's a lot more coming up.